Church, we're starting a brand new sermon series uh, this month entitled Gratitude. And if you notice up here, right underneath the stage, we kind of have a wall of gratitude. For those of you who maybe didn't get to come to our Friendsgiving dinner last night here at the church, you truly missed a special time and what an event it was. And if you notice everything up here, we ask people to come up and just write things on this wall of things that they are thankful for of what God has done in their life. You know, each and every one of us, we have a lot to be thankful for, don't we? So this whole month, we were going to look at the the word gratitude and how we express gratitude to our Heavenly Father. It tells us in 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 18, it says this. It says, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. I like that in the beginning where it says, in all circumstances. Church, we are, we are to give thanks in all situations, right? But I love what it says in the second half. It says, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. It is God's will in your life for you to have gratitude. It's not a suggestion. He said, that's what I want in, in your life. How many of you have, have lost someone that you loved? I mean, suddenly. I mean, they were just gone. <clears throat> You know, several years back, I, I lost my dad, and, um, and it was a very sudden thing. It was, he wasn't sick ever, and just one of them situations, and God called him home. And, and, and I remember just these feelings that would, would come over me in that situation. You know, when it's completely unexpected, for those of you who have experienced it, when it's completely unexpected, when this typically happens, what generally follows is it causes us to look inward, to evaluate our life's significance. You know what I'm talking about? It, it, it's as if the, you know, the grief, the shock, maybe even the anger stirs inside of us to consider the significance of our own experience this side of heaven. So as we contemplate and we wrestle with life's significance, at times we ask ourselves certain questions, and the questions are, are such as these. It's like, what is most important in life? Seriously, what is most important in life? When, when you're going through those things, you're not sitting there thinking about, oh, my house and, and my job and, 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 you know, all those kind of things. You're not thinking about that. Maybe you even ask the question such as this, why leave a legacy that benefits those that I leave behind? And a legacy is the way you impacted the people around you with the life that you've lived. Or maybe you've even thought of this question, how will, basically, like, well, how will I build in this life that will carry on into the eternal life? So as humans, what we desire a lot, church, we desire a life of worth. We really do. We, we desire a life of worth. You know, a life of significance. You can't help it. It's built into your DNA. And although you must remember, this significance is also in the eye of the beholder. The person that is in that, right? And so we all want to leave this world knowing that we served a purpose. So the question is this this morning. What makes our life significant? What makes your life, what makes my life significant? You know, we know that work, you know, play, right? Things that we have, you know, our tribe of people. A lot of people look at it that way. You know, our house, our investments, even even our service, right? Right? can add value to our lives. We would all agree with that. But listen, they don't define it. That does not define your life. So if you want your life to be significant, if you really and truly want your life to be significant, what should we be doing? It is significant now when we pass. Think about it. The Bible tells us to practice gratitude. The Bible says to practice gratitude, and gratitude gives us significance in the life and after we pass. So what is gratitude? I'm going to give you Webster's Dictionary definition of gratitude. It's this. It's the practice of actively remembering and expressing the grace and goodness bestowed on our lives. I really want you to get that, so I'm going to read to you one more time. The practice of actively remembering and expressing the grace and the goodness bestowed on our lives. That's what gratitude is. And according to God's word, through gratitude, we begin to appreciate life's goodness. 
So gratitude creates within us a deep sense of happiness and a deep sense of satisfaction. That's what gratitude will do. And then what happens is, the residual effect of it is, is it enriches our relationships with the people around us, right? It helps us to maybe even form new friendships. So today I want to give you four points about gratitude. And the first one is this, if you're writing things down, we have natural desire to show gratitude for the goodness and grace that we receive. You have a natural desire for that. You know, in the book of Genesis, we witness one of the first acts of gratitude through the life of Noah. So if you want to turn there with me today, we're going to be looking in Genesis chapter 8. So in Genesis chapter 8, if you'll look at it with me, and we're going to be looking at at Noah and, and the way he expressed gratitude. Genesis chapter 8, verses 15 through 20 says this, Then God said to Noah, Come out of the ark, you and your wife and your sons and their wives. Bring out every kind of living creature that is with you, the birds, the animals, all the creatures that move along the ground, so they can multiply on the earth and be fruitful and increase in number on it. So Noah came out together with his sons, his wife, and his sons' wives, all the animals, all the creatures that move along the ground, and all the birds, everything that moves on land came out of the ark, one kind after another. And check out verse 20. It says this, Then Noah built an altar to the Lord, taking some of all the clean animals and clean birds, and he sacrificed burnt offerings on it. I want you to maybe try to think about this. So after being on the ark for approximately one year, Noah walks out of the boat, okay? God commanded to do that. And and then what he did was this. He built an altar to the Lord. If you notice what I read to you there in verses 15 through 20, God never commanded him to build an altar. All he did is he said, hey, you, your wife, your, your sons and their wives and all the animals, it's time to come out. He never said, and I want you to go and build an altar and make a sacrifice to me. He didn't say that. But Noah, what did he do? He built that altar to the Lord. He built an altar. So Noah's first recorded act, right, after leaving the ark was an act of gratitude. You know, this is really easy to skip over as we're reading this. But for Noah, this was an extraordinary act of thankfulness. I want you to think about this for a moment. So Noah spent approximately 365 days on the ark, right? I can only imagine how he's like, man, I can't wait to get away from these animals. You know, my sons are driving me crazy, right? You know, all those kind of things. And so as he walks off this boat, Noah made a very conscious decision. He decided, and his conscious decision was the very first thing that he was going to do is he was going to say, thank you, God. Lord, I thank you for what you did. God didn't direct him to do that. And check this out. At this time, there wasn't any commandments that had been given down, right? Those come later with Moses. There was no commandments that was given down. There wasn't, you know, like rules of worship at this time. Organized religion and faith practices was still a long way off from being formed when Noah came off that ark. And Noah and his family had been the only followers of God in a society of evil heathens. (laughs) So Noah, he was on his, on his own on this one. This was a conscious decision. He wasn't copying what other people was doing. You know, there wasn't people, other people building altars like, oh, I better do that because that's the thing to do. And a sacrifice of thanksgiving, it was not a habit in that day. See, during Noah's time, right, during this time period, the only sacrifices that were being made was from the pagans to false gods, right? And, and, and they did this in an act of worship to false gods, by the way, to keep the fake gods happy so that the people could have good fortunes. That's why they were doing this. See, Noah didn't offer a sacrifice out of the need for good fortune. That's not why he did it. It wasn't a desire to keep God happy or to appease him, he offered this sacrifice out of a heart of gratitude, just being thankful. See, it was his natural inclination when when having, when he was leaving that, you know, ginormous wooden box just to say, thank you, God. Thank you for what you've done. Think about all the things that Noah could have done when he left that ark 
for the first time, right? You know, for a solid year, he was stuffed in that box, right? And, and this ship wasn't like a cruise ship for those of you who've been blessed to go on a cruise. It wasn't nothing fancy. You know, I imagine that this boat was just drenched in the stench and the mess of every animal that had ever walked on the earth, right? It probably was not a very appealing place to be. But while in this box, man, he would have been tossed around, right, by the winds and the rain and the waves for that full year that he was on there. And so the the ark finally rests on the mountaintop, and Noah can walk out into fresh air. Church, I want you to imagine, what would your first act be? The very first time you could walk out of that boat, right? Would it be to build an altar and to say thank you? You know, I wonder what my reaction personally, Mark Blakely, would have been. Remember, church, we have a basic desire to show gratitude for the goodness and the grace that we receive. Second point I want to make to you today is this. God responds to acts of gratitude. God responds to acts of gratitude, right? If you go back to Genesis chapter 8, we'll pick it up back up in verse 21, right? It says, the Lord smelled the pleasing aroma and said in his heart. Now I want to stop there. Remember, Noah, he was just offering up a sacrifice on the altar, a burnt offering. So the Lord smelled the pleasing aroma and said in his heart, never again will I curse the ground because of humans, even though every inclination of the human heart is evil from childhood. How you like that one, right? And then never again will I destroy all living creatures as I have done. As long as the earth endures, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night will never cease. And then check out chapter 9, verse 1. It says this, then God blessed Noah and his sons, saying to them, be fruitful and increase in number and fill the earth. So as that aroma drifted up to God, I want you to just picture that. As that aroma of that, 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 that burnt offering on the altar drifted up towards the Lord, the Bible says it touched his heart. It touched God's heart. So, so in turn, he says, never again. Why curse the ground because of man's evil heart? And then I love it. It says in chapter 9, verse 1, it says, Then God blessed Noah and his sons. He blessed them. Listen to me, church. God blessing Noah was not a response to anything that Noah had earned. It was not a response to that. See, Noah's blessing was not because he was a stellar ship captain who kept the morale of his crew in high spirits. It had nothing to do with that. The blessing wasn't because Noah completed the ark and built it by God's building code. That's not what the blessing was from. It was not a reward for Noah's exceptional care of all the animals on the ark. Noah's blessing, it wasn't even a response to his obedience, although blessings can come from choosing obedience to God's word. But in this case, in this story, Noah received his blessing because he chose to worship God. He chose to worship him, which this pleased the Lord. It pleased the Lord because Noah's heart was thankful, right? Noah's emotion overflowed into an act of gratitude. Remember what I read to you in 1 Thessalonians. It says that act of gratitude, that action of gratitude is the will that God has for your life. He wants you to be thankful. It was an offering to the Lord. In the Bible, you know, the word gratitude is the word eucharista. Right? It stems from the word charis, which means grace. So charis means grace, meaning a favor or an act of goodwill, loving and kindness that we do not deserve. Right? We don't deserve it. And so Eucharist, let me tell you the definition of that. It's an offering of thanks out of the abundance of grace shown for us. That's what it is. It's an offering. So Eucharist, it's not a horizontal practice. You know, it's not a give and take. It's not a to and from. That's not what it is. See, grace does not travel one way and then back again, right? So Eucharist is a reciprocal. It is a cycle of giving and receiving at the same time. And it is what maybe you've heard this term before. It's called grace abounding is what it's called. See, the Bible tells us that God does not desire sacrifice just for sacrifice sake. 
It's not one of those things that, you know, we just do it because we have to. You know, it's a habit. That's what we've always done. That's not what God is requiring, right? right? Or doing it because, you know, everybody else is doing it. The Bible tells us that God delights in our expression. That expression. It's our outward expression of what's in our hearts. In Psalm 51, it says this to us, church. In Psalm 51, verses 15 through 17, it says this. Open my lips, Lord, and my mouth will declare your praise. You do not delight in sacrifice, or I would bring it. You do not take pleasure in burnt offerings. My sacrifice, O God, is a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. You, God, will not despise it. He's saying, listen, by choosing to practice gratitude, we we choose, church, the grace that God has freely offered offered to each and every one of us. And we offer it freely back to him as well as others. That's what we do. Gratitude is something that we choose and then we practice it. You choose it, then you practice it. And and, and we have to practice it, right? It's kind of like you have to practice God's presence in your life. you got to practice gratitude as well. Listen, the gratitude that we're talking about is much more than just saying thank you. It's practicing Eucharist, right? Let me remind you what that is, right? It's an offering, right? Thanks, an offering of thanks out of the abundance of grace shown to us. It flows out of us. It flows out of that sentiment of thankfulness. It's the gratitude for God's grace. It's more recognition than, it's more than the recognition of God's grace, but it's a felt response that we express. That's what gratitude is. You know, this is God's grace that has been poured out. It's been poured out, right, as an expression of love. That's what God has done for each and every one of us. And so when we receive God's grace in our life, we should naturally want to express it. You know, express what God has done. See, we do not always, church, know how it will come out how it will be used or where it will go. But when we receive grace, we need to have a desire to express it. So listen, God responds to acts of gratitude. Third point I want to give to you today is just as simple as this. It's grace. It's grace. It's easy to recognize God's grace in our life when life's greater needs are being met, right? It's so easy. Like, oh, look at what God's doing. Man, he's giving me this. He's taking care of this. He's doing all these things. Or when we're receiving, when we're on the receiving end of God's unmerited generosity, it's easy. It's so easy. You know, children are a very perfect example of this, right? As parents, one of our biggest tasks is to raise polite and emotionally aware children who say what? Thank you. Right? You know, at your child's birthday party, right, you're continuing your mind as they're opening up their presents. Tell them thank you, say thank you, say thank you, right? You got to keep reminding your child to do that. At church, when someone comes up and gives your child a piece of candy, even before that piece of candy hits your child's hand, what do we blurt out? What's our go-to response? What do you say, Jimmy? Right? Implying that there has to be a response of gratitude for this free and undeserved gift as parents. As parents, some of our most humiliating moments arise from our kids' ungrateful behavior, isn't it? One of my three sons, and I ain't going to say which one it was. We'll protect the innocent here. When he was about three years old, and, and, and my wife loved to dress our kids up for church. I mean, they looked, they looked really good when they came to church. They looked spot on. And So he's three years old, and he, he was a wild man at three He was that kid that was just always running around the church, and the parents were going, hey, get back here, and chasing him and all that kind of stuff. And I remember over at the the church building, the long hallway on the back to Fellowship Hall, he took off running, and I'm following down the hallway, and all of a sudden, he stops and sees this lady. Her name was Thelma Headley. For those of you who had the blessings of knowing her, sweetest woman around, right? And, And so my son is all dressed up. He looks good. He got a brand new, cute little haircut. And... She stopped him. She said, don't you look cute in your suit and your new haircut? You know what my son did? He pulled his leg back and went, kicked her right in the shin as hard as he could and took off running. Let me tell you what. I snatched that boy up 
took him straight to the left to the boys' bathroom, and there were noises that came out of that bathroom <laughs> that usually didn't. <laughs> Listen to me. When their words and actions are perceived as being disrespectful, but when it comes from some smaller graces in life, we don't always feel them in that moment, do we, church? Sometimes we act like a child like that. We do. We act like a child in that moment. See, often what we do is we fail to recognize God's abundant grace throughout the day. I'm just talking about normal days. You know what? Thanksgiving, that's great. We all get together. You have a big feast with your family. Everyone, hey, tell us what you're thankful for. Maybe you go around the table. Somebody prays in the house. We're so thankful for all this great stuff, right? I'm talking about what a normal Tuesday looks like for you. What does a normal Tuesday look like for you? How often do you fail to recognize God's abundant grace throughout just a normal day for you? What he's doing and what he's done. Here's a litmus test for you that you can take to actively identify God's grace in your life as well as in my life. See, we can see this, church, by our practice of gratitude. You can see it. Here's a question. Maybe it's a, you can practice this and ask yourself this. When does God hear me offer grace for his grace in my life. We just flat out, Lord, thank you for saving me the way that you did. I was a smoking hot mess, still am, still struggling, Lord, but thank you for your grace, right? Or maybe you're only praying to God when it's at the dinner table when you're in a rush to fill that belly of yours. You know, you just throw out a quick prayer, rub a dub dub, thanks for the grub. I hope you don't do that. But I'm talking about, are you, are, are you sincere about what is it God's done? You know, how does my response, personally, how does your response to his grace, what does that sound like to you? Church, listen to me. Do you contemplate his grace? I mean, you're really thinking about like, wow, God, look what you've done. And then you say thanks for it. Do I do it out of intentional reflection? I'm talking about an intentional reflection of his goodness and kindness of what God has done for me in my life or what he's done for you in your life. Or, or do I repeat the same lines over and over again every night right before I go to bed? You know, do you take the time to consider, I mean consider, church, God's goodness and kindness that he bestows upon you just throughout your normal day? Or do you wake up in the morning and say, like King David did, Thank you, God, for another morning, and I love what he taxed on the end of it, with new mercies. Because, God, I know I'm going to mess it up, and you are so merciful. Your grace abounds just throughout my life. See, when someone who's been sick, and maybe you've been around this, have you ever known someone who's been sick, and, and I mean, it's just going downhill quick, and they had that rally day, you know what I'm talking about, where you go to visit them at the hospital, and you're like, whoa, they're sitting up, and they're talking, and everything's clear, right? You know, that rally day. Do you thank God, like, God, thank you for this one day, for a clear mind, and some strength and energy for us to talk one more time? Church, when we slow down and we take time to recognize God's grace in our life, I'm talking about we as believers, when we desire to give him thanks. See, if God's grace, if God's grace is all around us and it is working in us and through us, right, then we naturally should desire to show and receive gratitude at recognizing God's grace. And here's the key, and we are expected to do so by our Heavenly Father. He expects you to do that, to tell him thank you, right? Just like you do with your kids. You know, when you give your kids something, when they don't say thank you, you're like, well, what do you say? Or you give them that old, like, smart alecky one, welcome, right? We expect that from our children. But let me tell you what, your Heavenly Father, he expects that gratitude from you. For what is he's done. In 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 14, it says this to us. It says, the grace of our Lord was poured out on me abundantly. I love what Paul's saying right there. He didn't say, I got a little bit of sprinkle of it. 
He didn't say, I found a crumb of it. He said, no, the grace of our Lord was poured out on me abundantly along with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. He said, man, I got a lot. And here's the thing, church. I would venture to say, so have you. So have you. The fourth and final point I want to make to you today is this. It's simple. It's gratitude. It's just gratitude. It's the practice of remembering God's grace, right? There's a little ritual that is tucked into the middle of the Passover story that often goes unnoticed. And unless you really know Jewish tradition, you've probably never even heard of it. But before Passover night, the Lord gave very clear and precise instructions to the Israelites. And God's like that, right? I mean, he's very detail-oriented. Here's what I want you to do. And so before the Passover was going to happen, while they were in slavery in Egypt, he says, here's what you do. And if you look with me in Exodus chapter 12, it says this. In Exodus chapter 12, verses 24 through 27, it says, Obey these instructions as a lasting ordinance for you and your descendants. So God is being very specific here. He said, When you enter the land that the Lord will give you as he promised, observe this ceremony. And when your children ask you, What does this ceremony mean to you? Then tell them, It is the Passover sacrifice to the Lord who passed over the houses of the Israelites in Egypt and spared our homes when he struck down the Egyptians. Then the people, they bowed down and they worshiped. Church, what does this have to do with gratitude and grace? God knows that his people are forgetful. How many of you are forgetful people? I'm talking about like you walk into one room and you're like, what am I even doing in here? I mean, we're talking 10 steps and suddenly you're in another room and you can't even remember what you walked in that room for. And when you look at the story of the Israelites, man, they were constantly forgetting what God had done in their life. And they saw wild stuff, wild things happen. But he knew that they were forgetful. He knew that they struggled with this. He also knows that we repeat the same mistakes over and over again, don't we? It's not just your children that repeats the same mistakes over and over again. It's you and I. We do the same thing, don't we? It's because we forget the lessons of our past. See, God knew if he didn't set future practices in place, the Israelites, they would forget their salvation from Egypt. He knew that they would forget it, that they would eventually forget God's extravagant acts of grace. And the lack of remembrance, listen to me this morning, their lack of remembrance would lead to a lack of gratitude, which would then lead to a hardened heart. Church, and without gratitudes, without gratitude towards the Lord for what he has done, we are in that same boat. Our hearts can also become hardened. We can also forget about what it is that God has done in our lives, in our hearts, in our minds. See, so the Israelites, their hearts would grow hard, and they would forget the Lord's salvation as he brought them out of Egypt. And he says, and then you'll just end up slaves again. Church, do you get where I'm going here this morning? See, in order for us to not fall back into our old ways, in order for us to not fall slaves to our former addictions or maybe our old lifestyles or or our old sinful past, right, or to our former selves of who we were before we became believers in Jesus Christ, we have to remember, right? We have to remember and practice God's grace in our lives. you got to practice gratitude. I'm talking about practicing it. I'm saying, you know what, Lord? I want to thank you again for whatever it is that you've done. So as I ask the praise team to come up here, I want to give you three important questions that you can ask yourself to make sure that you are practicing gratitude. And the first one is this. What is most important in my life? What is most important in my life? You know, how do I live fully? So that I'm ready to die. I, I've been to a lot of deathbeds in this job, a lot of them. And there are a lot of people that when I go in and see them, you know what they'll tell me? Like, I'm ready to go. I don't know why God still has me here. 
I don't understand why, why I'm still breathing right now. Where, where they are completely ready to go. So how do you and I live fully so that we're ready to pass? And the third question is this. How will what I build in this life carry into my eternal life? The things that you're building up, the things that you're doing in this life, how is that going to carry over into your eternal life? See, the answer to these questions, it's not a response to our doing, right? It's not a response to that. See, no one understood. No one understood obedience leads to receive grace, but it does not create grace. See, grace is not a gift that piggybacks on anything. It doesn't. Grace is a free gift from our Heavenly Father. And so for you and I to live a meaningful life, we must begin by accepting what is freely given and offer back to God our gratitude. I mean truly being thankful. So maybe this morning you're sitting here and you're like, I want to practice that gratitude but I really don't know how. I want to ask yourself, I want you to ask yourself this question. First off, are you saved? Do you truly have a full understanding of what it is that God has done in your life? I'm talking about he has taken away your sin. He has taken away your shame, right? The Bible says he has cast it as far as the east is from the west, right? Never be brought back up again. Do you understand? Do you fully fathom what that is? Do you get the fact that he has given you a brand new life and it's life more abundant? Do you understand what he is preparing for you in heaven? Every single one of us that knows Jesus Christ, that he is preparing in advance in heaven for each and every one of us. This morning, if you don't get that, I want you to ask yourself, are you saved? Have you submitted your life to Jesus Christ? Are you grateful for what it is he's done in your life? Maybe if you can say no to that question, I want to offer you an opportunity right now that you can receive that gift. I'm talking about that gift of grace, that you can receive Jesus Christ in your heart. That all you've got to do is ask him to come in. It's that simple, church. We make it so hard. You don't have to get to a certain level. You don't have to get to a certain point. No, he says, I will take you right where you're at. Right exactly where you're at. So if that's for you, I want to encourage you to come forward today. We'll help you take care of that. We'll pray with you. And for the rest of you believers who are sitting here, I'm going to ask you this. Are you practicing gratitude? I'm talking about you are recognizing what it is that God has done in your life. And you're not just waiting for Thanksgiving and I'll catch you back again next year, Lord. I'm talking about you are daily recognizing, God, thank you for what it is that you've done for me. So how about it, church? Let's stand again, let's sing. But I want to encourage you to respond this morning.